We paid $624 for the new AMD Ryzen 9 7900X 3D CPU. This wasn't sampled by AMD, so we had to buy it on launch day, overnight it, and we're still turning around review in just about 12 hours from the time we received this. We moved quick on this one. These CPUs are really interesting because as we talked about in the 7950X 3D review, which is already up, there's some really peculiar behavior with the X3D CPUs. And a lot of that has to do with core parking or effectively disabling half of the cores and with how the cache is isolated to one CCD. So let's get started with the review of the 12 core alternative, which is priced MSRP $100 less than the 16 core we already reviewed. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now and we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So some quick basics. There are three CPUs in the new X3D family following up the successful 5800X3D. Those three, as we said in the last review, are the 7950X3D, the 7900, and then the 7800. And the 7800 doesn't arrive until April. We expect AMD will probably sample those, but it's, it's a little ways out. So you'll have to wait on the review for that. The 7900 is $100 below the 7950X3D, and then the 7800 will be $450, so massive drop in price. But also the 7800X3D, its biggest weakness is going to be the frequency which AMD has brought down. It's about a 6700 megahertz delta, and depending on how the games behave with cache versus frequency, it's possible the 78X3D doesn't perform well enough to make up for that frequency loss. Likewise, it's possible performance just well enough to avoid spending all the money on these. So first of all, as we get started in the review, thank you to my team for working late here with me tonight on getting this through. This is full team effort to get this one published uh, as quickly as possible after, again, buying retail and shipping it. So uh, we are, we're excited. We, I, I love working on this kind of stuff at this kind of speed. It makes the job really fun. So as for the core specs, the 7950X3D and the 7900X3D and likewise the 78 require some specific setup steps that you can't skip. You really need to make sure you do this stuff right. Otherwise, you're potentially robbing yourself of upwards of 30% of your performance if you configure it incorrectly. It's pretty easy to configure right for the most part. Uh, it's chipset and BIOS updates, but uh, and then Xbox Game Bar, which kind of sucks, but uh, we'll talk about that. Anyway, the main reason this is even a consideration, all these setup steps, is because the cache is isolated to a single CCD. It's the leftmost one with the IO die oriented at the bottom. And to reduce the cross CCD latency while promoting utilization of that extra cache, AMD is leveraging Xbox Game Bar as a trigger mechanism to park or disable half the cores during known gaming workloads. And that's where this explanation is going to stop so we don't repeat everything we already said. We'll link it below. Go check that out for the full details. So the 7900X3D critically moves to a 6 plus 6 layout. That means it's, so it's a 12 core part. It's got 24 threads because it's hyper threaded using, uh, it's got SMT basically. And the 6 plus 6 layout means there's six cores on each CCD. And it's still the same as the 7950X3D where the V cache is only on one of them. So when you park half the cores, you're going to be parking six. You're down to six active cores plus all of the cache in that column, as opposed to the 7950X3D, where you were cut down to eight cores plus all that cache in the column. So the difference here is going to be two cores when parking is utilized, which depending on the game may be significant. But for the most part, it helps to reduce some of that original full CPU delta, which is four cores. Here's how this one's laid out. So the 7900X3D is configured as a 64 megabyte plus 32 megabyte cache on that left die, and then 32 megabytes on the right die. The total here is 128, and the L2 cache comes down a little bit. So L2 is contingent on the presence of cores, uh, and you lose a total of one megabyte per core. So the 79X3D comes down to 12 megabytes total of L2, versus 16 on the 16 core 7950X3D. Pretty simple math to do. Uh, if you're not too familiar with it, the lower the number in the cache level, the faster that cache is, but also the smaller uh, it is. So when you're talking about 
uh, SRAM, really expensive, really small capacities. You want as much sort of L1, L2 as you can get, and L3 is still way better than system memory, but slower than L2. With all the details and with you fully informed on how these things work now, we're going to move over to our power testing station to talk about power consumption. So getting into power testing, it's pretty straightforward. We test at 100% load. We fully load the CPU. This helps to eliminate some of the background noise that you pick up in testing, where it's more difficult to test for idle power consumption, which we do that as well, but we don't normally publish it because it's noisy data. So for this, we are strictly looking at the EPS 12 volt cables, and we are not able to factor out the VRM efficiency losses, but we are able to factor out the entire rest of the system. So it isolates it down to just the CPU, more or less, plus some efficiency losses. And then we take those numbers and we run some simple math against the blender render time numbers that we have for production testing. And with those two figures, we're able to produce an efficiency chart whose unit is in watt hours. And that tells us the energy consumed over a period of time, how efficient is this CPU versus some of the competition. So those are the two charts we're gonna look at next. Let's look at power consumption first. Here's the power consumption chart at full load. The 7900X3D pulled 120 watts when under load, tying it with the ever impressive R9 5950X. The original 7900X required 200 watts in the same workload. So AMD's reduced PPT is showing here, and that's the one that matters more than TDP. The X3D has been tuned for greater efficiency, reducing the thermal envelope, which better accommodates the very thermally sensitive V-cache. The 7950X3D also saw improvement here, dropping to 156 watts from the original 263 on the 7950X. Intel is at the deep end of this chart. It's running at 295 watts in the same all-core workload. Although the efficiency under less consistent gaming conditions would be more favorable towards Intel, the all-core workload is pretty hard on it. AMD's efficiency in this type of workload is strong, and it shows well on the 79X3D. That's probably the main takeaway for this part. Here's the power efficiency chart. In this one, the 7900X3D plots towards the top, even though its overall performance in an all-core render isn't that much different from the non-3D 7900X, but the efficiency is. The 7900X3D's 17 watt hour result has it just behind the 7950X3D and the lower TDP 7900 non-X. And otherwise, it's far ahead of Intel's 13700K for efficiency, which itself is at 38 watt hours, and it's ahead, of course, the 13900K, which is at 33 watt hours. So the 7900X3D continues the trend of improving power efficiency in all core work. Okay, enough of all the power testing. Now we're gonna get into the component testing section of our lab. So these benches, the two over here and the two over here, have been running CPUs and GPUs nonstop for like a year now. Well, actually several years if you count the previous office, but a year in this location. And the next one that went in was the 7900X3D. So we ran through all those tests and the main thing we were looking for is gaming. We have production tests as well. Just in this review, it's gaming where you're gonna see the biggest differences. And we arrange the gaming tests so that they're the most interesting at the front end. So the first two especially, and then after that, they get much closer together. So let's get started. As a quick reminder, the chipset driver difference is huge. We'll show that chart here again from the last review. The gaming gains are upwards of 30% with the correct driver features and Xbox game bar. So this testing was done with that configuration. Check the 7950X3D for more info on this chart. Far Cry 6 starts us off. This one has remained an interesting test for X3D ever since the 58X3D. The 7950X3D capped out at 198 FPS average, with the 7900X3D now achieving over 98% of the total performance of the 7950 for about $80 to $100 cheaper than the 7950X3D, that is. And that's for about 86% of the price. So, Pretty good positioning. It's obviously still somewhat ridiculous though when compared to most other things. So the 13900K or the much more sensible 13600K are in a better value position and still maintain most of the performance. And the 13600K is still the best high-end value by a long shot versus any of these. The 7900X3D doesn't really sacrifice anything here though versus the plus 50 version. It's close to error. We suspect that the future 78X3D, barring major losses from frequency, could be similarly impressive in games like this one that benefit so much from cash. That's a good start for the 79X3D as compared to that of the 7950, but that's only one part to compare it to. Compared to the original 7900X, which is currently $433 on Amazon, the 79X3D posted an improvement of 13% against baseline. 
So that's a $200 price difference. At that point, you're effectively paying $15 per single digit percentage point uplift. And if you use a less totally arbitrary metric than that one, you can look at it as increasing the cost by 38% MSRP to MSRP for 13% more performance. Really not a good deal. And it's possible AMD didn't ship this to press because they were worried it would undercut the entire existence of the 7950X 3D, or they were worried that it would look bad versus the 7900X. Both of those are options right now. And the 7950X 3D itself is already heavily embattled with the cheaper 13900K, the 13600K, and AMD's own 5800X 3D. And in production, why would you buy it? You just get the 7950X instead. Anyway, let's move on to the next test to see if that conspiracy theory plays out. As you all get your DIY tinfoil hat kits ready, Tomb Raider is next. This one isn't as impressive though. In this scenario, the 7900X 3D got stuck at 334.7 FPS average. So that means the 7950X 3D leads the 79X 3D by 14% here, with the 5800X 3D embarrassing the 7900X 3D by tying it, or functionally tying it. 1% lows are more or less the same between all of these parts, especially with the wider error in measuring frame time consistency, although the 7950X 3D has a slight advantage in 0.1% lows. The 5800X 3D makes the 7900X 3D look bad here. Saying the X3D a lot is getting really tiring, by the way, but I don't have a way to shorten it yet. Leave your suggestions in the comments. Today, though, the 5800X 3D is still available for about $330, so it's almost half the price of the new 7900X 3D, and in this game, the performance is identical. Compared to Intel, the 13900K is the next closest at 304 FPS average. That achieves 91% of the performance of the 79X 3D. The 13900K also carries minimally equivalent lows, if not proportionally stronger. Against the original 7900X, the good news for AMD is that it was able to plot an uplift of 18%, which is big. I mean, that's a big jump for something that has primarily changed only by adding cash. It's just not a value part, and the 5800X 3D spoils everyone. But as far as the technology working and ignoring all other arguments, it is working. 18%, pretty good. As for Final Fantasy XIV, this test has kept Intel at the top of the stack since the 13th series launched. And the 7950X 3D pushed from 214 to 256 FPS average, that was a noteworthy gain. And the 7900X 3D climbed similarly from 209 to 251 but is very close to the 7950X 3D, so it sort of challenges the value of the 7950X 3D and reinforces one of the two main reasons why AMD might not have shipped it out with the initial samples. So this is a 20% climb from the 7900X to the X3D, but the 13600K remains the better option, which even though the 79X 3D sort of undercuts the 7950, the 13600K undercuts both of them. Counter-Strike GO is next, and CSGO, the 7900X 3D ran at 387 FPS average with lows at 250 and 147, which is all fine. The 7950X 3D had lows functionally the same and an average that's technically a little bit lower. The 7900X leads the 7900X 3D marginally here, and likewise, the previous observation we had was a 419 FPS average 7950X leading the 7950X 3D's 384 FPS average result. So this is in line with what we saw. In this scenario, running on the lower frequency cores is costing more than the extra V-cache adds. CSGO just can't make use of that cache. Compared to Intel, the 13600K maintains a good value position with AMD's own 7700X coming out stronger than the 7900 options. The game just isn't complex enough to leverage the high-end, high-core count CPUs with a lot of cash, or even individually. And the 13900K, it gets utilized here, but it's focused heavily on raw frequency and architecturally they're different, so it's expected for Intel in this one. 1440p with CSGO isn't much different. Once again, the 7700X and 13700K outperform the new X3D CPUs, and the rest looks very similar, so let's move on. Rainbow Six Siege brings back the FPS benchmarks of an FPS that's really high in FPS. That's two high FPS FPSs back to back for FPS benchmarking. The 7900X 3D ran at 809 FPS average here with lows proportionally spaced and completely expected as compared to the rest of the cluster surrounding it. And that result has it basically within error of the 7700X and behind the 7950X, outside of error for that one. It's also behind the cheaper 13700K and 13900K alike, the latter of which still leads this chart. The 79X 3D achieves 96% of the 7950X 3D's performance here, and the 7950X 3D posted a gain of 2.3% over the 7950X, with the X3D's improvements over the 7900X 
at 2.1%. So, so they're just not that useful in this game. Cyberpunk remains a challenging game for all components to handle. For CPUs, we still see some scaling at the high end, though, when using a 4090. The 79X3D ran at 256 FPS average, with 1% and 0.1% lows slightly disproportionately below where its neighbors land. The i7-13700K in particular comes ahead stronger in consistency, although not necessarily noticeably. Blender Cycles is up first for production, using each thread on the CPU to generate a new render tile. The 7900X3D required 8.5 minutes to complete the render, with the lower being better. The 7900X was advantaged as a result of its higher frequency and higher power design, and posted a 6% improvement over the 7900X3D. The 7950X3D met the same fate, as we said in the previous review. Most workstation applications won't benefit from the cache here and will instead be hurt by the reduced power available to the core. Chromium code compile is up now, and this one, the 7900X3D, required 47 minutes to complete the full code base compile. The 7900X did the same in 46 minutes, so they're identical. It's within run-to-run -run variants here, and the 7950X and X3D were similar in this regard. In 7-zip file compression up next, the 7950X3D previously was positioned slightly ahead of the 7950X, but it was with an error. The 7900X3D is the same, it completed 163,000 MIPS, whereas the 7900X did 165,000 MIPS, so there's no difference. In decompression, the 7900X3D and the 7900X are roughly the same once again. They range from 204 to 210,000 MIPS, with the results technically favoring the non-3D variant of the 7900X. Adobe Premiere and Photoshop are up last, using the Puget Suite to test for scrubbing, rendering, filters, and more. The 7950X scored 1,307 points in aggregate, putting it functionally tied with the 7950X, which itself was about tied with the 13900K. The 7900X3D was worse than the 7900X by 50 points here. It's not a lot, but it's definitely not better. Finally, in Photoshop, it's more of the same story. There's no benefit to the Vcache variant of the 7900X3D. I wrote one word for the conclusion of the 7900X3D, and that word is no, as in no, it is not worth buying. So this thing, sometimes it matches the 7950X3D in gaming. Great. Uh, if that were consistent and always the case, then the conclusion would be you probably in most cases shouldn't buy the 7950X3D, but at least it's technically the best a lot of the time. Uh, and then at least this is more or less equal to it, therefore you could buy this instead. But that's not the case. It's not, it's not routinely better, and in some places it gives up a meaningful lead. So this one, we understand why AMD didn't send this one out, because the 7950X3D gets a little bit of that sort of grace window where just because it is technically the best a lot of the time, it's easier to stomach the price only in the sense of a value judgment because we look at something that's at the top of the chart it doesn't get the same treatment as something that's in the middle and surrounded by 12 alternatives so this doesn't get that benefit because it's not at the top of the charts most of the time you get no benefit at all on any of the production or workstation tests that we run there's probably something out there that would uh in which case great but we have a pretty wide sweep of workstation tasks and none of them benefit from it. So that leaves us basically with gaming only as a use case for the 7900X3D uh, as we test CPUs, being mindful that you know there's something else out there, I'm sure. But with gaming only, you might as well buy a 13600K or a 13700K. Or if you're going the X3D route, it's like at least the 7950 is it, it has more of a lead in some places, but otherwise, the fact that it ties now and then, but not always, it's just, it's a weird part. So the, the conclusion for this one is no, simply put, and that's it for the 7900X3D. So uh, we're kind of disappointed in this one. It, it has potential, but the price just doesn't make sense. So we'll see how the 7800X3D does, and who knows, maybe they'll run a 76X3D in the future or something to make it interesting for us. But that's it for this one. It's kind of disappointing. So there's your review of it. Go to store.gamersnexus.net as always to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.